Hey guys, welcome back to Green Room. And this week I'm excited because we're turning the page. We're actually going to move into chapter seven. And uh, let me give you a quick snapshot of where we've been. We've been talking about uh, in Romans the five major sections. Uh, we talked about the salutations, that's the opening section, uh, sin, salvation, and now we're right in the heart of the section of sanctification. And really, we're right almost by the time we finish this. It'll bring us to a, approximately halfway point of the book itself. And so we're getting there. We are making progress. Some of you are saying, man, are we really? <laughs> we, I promise you we're making progress. Now, in last session, we, uh, we, uh, we spent a good deal of time talking about this concept of grace. Uh, uh, from Romans 6, 14, we talked about uh, the, uh, in Romans 6, 14, he says, you, you now live under the freedom of grace. And so we we took a deep dive into that. We talked about mm -hmm. six characteristics of grace, the eight different benefits of grace, and uh, we talked a little bit about mis some misconception of grace. Now, today we're going to look at Romans chapter 7, and we're just going to try to cover verses 1 through 13. We'll probably have to break this into two parts uh, at least, but this is a very, very key, important uh, chapter because Paul is going to uh, really dive deep into the issue uh, of the law. Now, just as a kind of quick snapshot, we're talking about in Romans 6, the key word of Romans 6 was sin. That was the key word was sin. In Romans 7, the key word is law, and then we'll move into Romans 8, where the key word is spirit. Those three concepts, sin, law, and the spirit of God, those three concepts, most important concepts you could possibly grab a hold of to understand the doctrine of sanctification. You have to understand uh, what these each mean. So in Romans 6, Paul said, we are dead to sin. In Romans 7, he's going to show us how we become dead to the law. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of that flip side. So let's start with uh, the reason. The reason we are free from the law. And probably the best thing to do is to take a quick break and actually explain what is the law. And so our buddies at the Bible Project give us a phenomenal explanation. We'll see you back here in about six minutes. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. And so some of the laws, they're about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just the complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Yeah, don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws and then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just gonna continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. 
And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new, transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others, and he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy, and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. So we we understand that the law was a little more complex than just, you know, the Ten Commandments. It had a lot more complexity to it. And what God was doing was this setup. And so Paul talks about this uh, in Romans 7. Now, a reminder, he talks about, uh, we've talked about in the past, legalism. That's when we're trying to earn God's approval uh, via our works. Now, we talked about grace. That's when we try to earn God's approval uh, by faith. And we apprehend God's approval through this concept. But legalism is we're saying, man, I'm trying to accomplish this by the law. And Paul is drilling this in the ground. Verses 1 through 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, you who are in fact familiar with the law, don't you know that the law only applies while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he's alive. And she would be committing adultery if she married uh, another man while he's alive. But if her husband dies, she is free. So here's the truth. Paul is saying the law can't apply to someone who's dead. It's sort of like, you know, a guy gets in a, you know, a major automobile accident and he's laying out on the concrete and he's literally dead and the cops come and write him a a ticket ticket. and give him a fine. You know, he's (laughs) like, dude, you broke the law. You ran the red light. Well, okay, that's great. But, you know, nobody's going to pay that ticket. It has no application. In other words, the law cannot bind itself to that which is dead. And so Paul is drilling in on this concept that we are dead to the law. And he picks up the the metaphor, the illustration of marriage. Now, I need to be clear here in these verses. This is not a teaching on marriage. You know, people try to say, oh, it's a great teaching on marriage. It's not a teaching about marriage. This is actually a teaching centered around an illustration of the applicability of the law 
to those who are dead. And so he's saying that first, the contract of marriage is binding only for as long as both parties are alive. But if one dies, then the contract is void. So that's why we say at a wedding, we'll say, till death do us part. And now, now uh, can you imagine being married to this guy? This, this guy, you know, you, you married Mr. Law. Imagine you married Mr. Law. You had the ceremony. You come home and he says, okay, now in order for this marriage to work, here's what I need you to do. I'm going to write out a list of tasks that I need you to accomplish every day while I'm at work. When I get home from work, I'll examine the list, I'll examine your work, and I'll see if you did it. If you did everything perfectly, we're okay. If you didn't, I will have to meet out some consequences. So, <laughs> what a great <laughs> marriage. And so he goes out to work, he comes home, and he goes to this list. Now, sadly, that list is 613 mm. individual tasks that he wanted her to do. She accomplished 612 of the 613. And he says, oh, uh, you failed. Uh, not mm -hmm. yeah. only did you fail, but you're a complete failure yourself. Because here's the, here's the deal, sweetheart. Uh, if you mess up one, you're guilty of all. And so this marriage is not going to work unless you do everything exactly the way I said. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, you know, she's got to be immediately thinking, how do I get out of this yes. relationship? <laughs> and and uh, according to his rules... According to his rules, the only way to get out of it, he's got to die. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to die. Well, Paul says someone died, and now she's free. Mm -hmm. And she's free for the new husband. And yeah. So, Gary, talk to us about the new relationship. Yeah, so we, have the, we get these results from being freed from the law, right? The, from, from, so what, how did we get there first, right? So this idea of um, Christ dying on the cross going down into the grave, and then being resurrected. What Paul does is he ties our acceptance of Christ to that death on the cross and says, in this whole relationship between us and the law, us and Mr. Law, the husband, we're the ones who do the dying because we become associated with Christ in his death, and therefore, when we're dead, that covenant's over, that relationship is over, and now we are free, totally free to start a new relationship. Check this out. In Romans 7, 3, it says, So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So he's setting up the premise. He's saying, look, this is how those laws work. And the only way we're going to do this is, is if we died. And so what's amazing is Christ's death accomplishes that death for us to get us out of that horrible relationship with the law. So but we don't, also, so we, 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 you know, we're coming uh, towards Easter, and each year we talk so much about the focus of what the cross accomplished. We do talk most frequently about what the cross did in the death of Jesus, but we don't often look at what you just said, which yeah. is we also, the death of the law, Mr. Law, the husband, mm -hmm. it was the death of the law. That's why we split the book, the Bible, into those two parts, and we often call them the Old Testament and the New Covenant or the New Testament, but it literally it's just the old way mm -hmm. law and the new law. So it, it, it really does help us to see that somebody died yep. and the death was that, that the death of the law. And then now we get to have a new relationship. And so that old relationship that was just frustrating and picky and I can't ever satisfy, that's over. And I get to be in this new relationship. And Paul describes it, it says in Romans 7, 4, so my dear brothers, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you're united with the one who was raised from the dead. And so just like we died with Christ, we are now united with Christ in resurrection. We have a new relationship, a new marriage to say, and that marriage is with Christ. And, and before we died, we were married to the law. Now that, that we've died and we've come back in association with Christ, we're married to him and resurrection and married to him, unlike the law, which is constantly saying, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. If you don't get it 100% right, Christ is telling us something completely different. We get to have a whole different kind of relationship with him. And it's not like just a simple relationship with a, with a book. That's, it's actually the God of the universe, right? Like a real person who, by the way, absolutely loves us and wants to have us do and be a part of amazing, amazing things, which is the next point. He gives us this brand new purpose as a result of this relationship with Jesus that we now have in Romans 7, 4. It says, we can produce a harvest of good 
deeds for God. Well, we weren't free when we were in that relationship with Mr. Law to do anything that would please God. It was impossible. We couldn't, we couldn't have these fruits. But when we are now in perfect, and you know, resurrected in relationship with Christ, suddenly the Holy Spirit's living in our hearts. We're getting all these, and we can start to bear fruit. I love how it uses, produce a harvest of good deeds, because that's alluding, a harvest is fruits, right? And we see the fruits of the spirits in the, in the Bible where it, it goes over, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking family ministry now. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and there's hand motions. My kids correct me on them every time. Ask your kids if they know the uh, fruits of the spirit song, right? <laughs> but that's good. The, but these, these, uh, these fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, like how many of us get that one on our own, right? But we get, to, we get in our relationship with Christ this ability to now begin to bear this fruit that's evidence of our faith, but it's, it's because of that love relationship. What were the fruits of that old relationship with the law? Frustration, failure, feeling like you're a failure. All these, he undoes all that. And then he says, okay, you can bear fruit, but you can also do good deeds. And suddenly our purpose is to help bring God's kingdom to earth here, right? By, by doing these very acts that he's designed us to do where we say, okay, you want me to step here? I'll step here. And then God shows up and does something bigger than you ever imagined possible in your life because he said, you know what? I'm in this relationship with Jesus. I'm going to do the things he wants me to do because I love him and because he loves me. He frees me to be able to choose to do those things. It's not like I'm being forced to do it. It's I'm stumbling on it and discovering how amazing God is in this new relationship that I'm being given. So it's super duper cool. And, and what's even really cool here is that we also have tipped, uh, touched on two Two areas that we're going to keep talking about, through, not only throughout Romans, but throughout all of Scripture. And that is the areas of, uh, you talked about the harvest of good deeds. Because you could ultimately say, now that I'm free from the law, like the Galatians said, mm -hmm. now I'm free from that. I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want. And right. he's actually saying, no, you actually are liberated to, to produce even better mm -hmm. deeds than you could have ever done by trying to you know keep Mr. Husband's checklist. Mm -hmm. So this idea of the balance between uh, grace and works, you know, my faith and my works, that balance is, is throughout the entirety of Scripture, that, that one, one actually breeds the other. If I try to breed grace and faith through good works, I, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to get there because perfection is the standard. But if, I, but if out of relational elements, uh, I actually come into a relationship with Christ through faith and receive His grace, I'm freed in order to do the good works that God planned for me from the very beginning. I can, I can do this list, and I can do it out of a flow of relationship. Relationship is such a big deal. It just, it just is. People think, oh, I'm supposed to believe in God. Like, it's a, okay, check, I believe. Or I'm supposed to live the right way. But when it all comes down to it, when you say, hey, I have a real relationship, and this is a person, a personal God who I have a relationship with, it changes everything about the way you think about Christianity and yep. uh, how you're going to live your life. And so relationship, relationship, relationship. And then the second, the second theme, uh, and that hits on what you just said, the second theme he's tripping over here is the, uh, the comparison and the understanding of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, this theme is going to keep coming up. The idea that Jesus Christ is the bride, you know, is, is uh, the groom and we are the bride and that relationship one to the other is, is woven not only throughout the New Testament, but even in Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, several of his parables had to do with the fact that he was the bride and that we're the groom and that, that we are preparing ourselves, you know, for his arrival. And so this, this idea of the relationship between us, you know, the church, uh, the bride of Christ and the groom, Jesus. I think I said that backwards just a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, so for all of our dyslexia uh, folks, <laughs> all of them are going, right on, yeah. bro. Uh, <laughs> but that relationship through through the union of marriage, that's going to play out again and again. This idea of uh, it being a marital relationship. And I think uh, the theme here is one of love. It is the sense of, it is a beautiful story of love and how Christ has brought us out of you know, the bondage of that relationship of works and trying to get, you know, get it right to, no, look, I love you. You know, you, you can leave the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Let's go hang out and spend some time. Mm -hmm. That's a concept you couldn't have done before Jesus came. And we're going to keep expanding on that. So that, we're going to wrap there today and uh, let you guys talk about this in small group. A little bit of the concepts of the law, uh, the relationship of uh, the death of the law, and a new relationship with Christ. 
and then uh, what that, you know, the implications of that, what that means. And so I hope you guys have a great time. We'll meet you here next time. We'll see you then.